So for all the familiar faces out there, you guys have uh, enjoyed another year of learning. This is the last lecture of, of this year, but I think we'll all go away smarter for everything that we heard. So tonight we're going to hear more about our lungs and the disease that can bother those. I'm going to introduce two speakers at the same time because they're going to kind of share the uh, beginning of this next presentation. Uh, Dr. Darren Sequence is board certified in internal medicine, pulmonary medicine, and critical care medicine. He earned his BA at Johns Hopkins University and his MD at New York Medical, Medical College. He also has an MBA from the USC Marshall School of Business. He completed his residency at the Wadsworth VA Hospital, UCLA Medical Center, and pulmonary critical care fellowships at UCLA Harbor Medical Center. He's an associate clinical professor of medicine at the Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, where he's involved with teaching medical students. Dr. Sinkowitz has been practicing in the South Bay for over 20 years. During his free time, he enjoys reading, watching his sons play soccer. He is also very active with volunteering and grow, goes frequently to provide medical care in Lyman, Honduras with the Carolina Honduras Health Foundation. So this is a man who probably has very little free time to enjoy reading. Uh, beside him is Dr. Richard Wynn. Dr. Wynn earned his BS in biochemistry and his MS in biochemistry and micro, um, excuse me, molecular biology at the University of California, Riverside. He traveled across the country to complete his MD at New York Medical College, after which he returned to his roots and completed his residency at Harbor UCLA Medical Center in Torrance. He joined the faculty of Harbor UCLA Medical Center in general internal medicine prior to starting his pulmonary critical care fellowship at UCLA Medical Center. During his fellowship, Dr. Wynn was involved in numerous basic science and clinical research studies, earning him the 2015 American Thoracic Society International Conference Abstract Scholarship. His areas of interest include idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and other interstitial lung diseases. Born and raised in Southern California, Dr. Wynn is an avid fan of the LA Lakers. When he's not at work, he enjoys yelling at his team on TV, yeah. cooking, and traveling the world. Please welcome Dr. Sinkowitz and Dr. Wynn. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, as pulmonologists, this is the basic area we cover. The lungs, uh, as you can see, they're highlighted in pink. The airways, uh, the heart's in the middle, and then surrounded by uh, the ribs um, and the uh, spinal column, the vertebral bodies, which protect uh, the lungs. So anything that affects the upper and lower airways, uh, we cover. Um, Anything that affects uh, the rib cage uh, or the spine, such as scoliosis or the nerves and muscles that uh, provide um, our breathing muscles also uh, can affect uh, your breathing, such as muscular dystrophy or strokes or uh, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. Well, who sees a pulmonologist? Um, usually patients are referred by their primary care physician but some come directly. The most common referral complaints we see are shortness of breath, coughing that doesn't go away, and chest pain. The problem is uh, these same complaints affect uh, a lot of diseases. So if you have those complaints and you Google search these complaints, you're gonna come up with basically everything from benign things to severe uh, critically uh, conditions. Um, <clears throat> so how do we sort what's going on? Dr. Wynn is gonna take us through that. So as pulmonologists, we have a lot of tools uh, in order to try to evaluate patients for uh, possible diseases. The first and foremost thing is when you meet a pulmonologist or any doctor, we're gonna listen to your story. We're gonna talk to you and we're gonna learn about your history. We're gonna learn about 
when you started having symptoms, how did those manifest, how bad are they, when do they occur, and things like that. That's usually the mainstay of our, the, the, the basis of any sort of evaluation. I always talk to patients about the various ways in which we can evaluate the lungs. Uh, we can listen to them with the stethoscope. Beyond that, we can also take a look at them by using x-rays, or if we need more detail, we'll get a CT scan where we'll get cross-sectional slices of lungs, and we can, in that fashion, see little, anything from little tiny nodules to areas of scarring. In even closer detail, we can actually take a camera and look inside the airways, down into your lungs, and we can see what's in there. Is there something that's um, obstructing the airways? Is there something that can be suctioned out, mucus, secretions? Is there a foreign body in there? Sometimes we've gone in there and we found things like teeth and food particles and whatnot. Beyond just looking at the lungs, we can also look at how they function. You know, the image of a car doesn't tell you how well it drives. It's more like, it's more about its function that's really important. One simple test that we do is the post oximetry. This is a device that uses light technology in order to measure how much oxygen is being carried by your blood, um, by your blood cells in your body. And it can give you an, what we call an oxygen saturation. We can also look at how your lung functions at the bedside or in the office with simple spirometry. This tells you how well air flows in and out of those lungs. For more advanced testing, we can send you to the, um, uh, the, the pulmonary function lab where we can do more extensive testing as to how well that air comes in and out of your lungs. We can look at how much air is actually filling up those lungs. We can look at how well it diffuses into your bloodstream, et cetera. And we can even take it a step further and do similar tests while you're bicycling on a bike. Maybe your symptoms only occur when you're uh, when you're exercising. So we can do cardiopulmonary exercise testing where we actually look at your EKG, how well your heart's handling it, and looking at how you're breathing while you exercise. With these various tests, we can try to identify various diseases that may be occurring in your lungs, such as pneumonia, bronchitis, asthma, COPD or emphysema, bronchiectasis, pulmonary fibrosis, or blood clots. These are a number of diseases that we're gonna touch base upon and uh, Coming up next is Dr. Sinkowitz, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about URIs, bronchitis, and the flu. Oops, sorry. Uh, we're going to just go over, start at the beginning. The simple ones is uh, upper respiratory infection, uh, bronchitis, and influenza, which is uh, pertinent because we're entering the flu season. Uh, they all can present with very similar symptoms, but they're all slightly different. An upper respiratory infection is basically the common cold, which is from a virus usually presenting with runny nose, cough, congestion, sore throat, usually self-limited. It's going to go away in a few days to two weeks at most, and it's treated symptomatically. Tylenol, uh, analgesics, cough medication, fluids and rest. Acute bronchitis is an infection of the lower uh, airways in, in the chest. Uh, it's also usually viral, and it probably should be better characterized as a chest cold rather than uh, uh, bronchitis sounds a little more uh, severe. Um, and also, it's um, similar symptoms, cough, sputum, and occasionally fevers. <coughs> but if the fevers uh, or other symptoms persist longer, then we sometimes think about uh, a secondary bacterial infection. Um, the cough, though, in bronchitis can linger on its own without having any evidence of infection for several weeks or months, and that's a common presentation that we do see, people coming in with prolonged cough, and even as a name, post-bronchitic cough. Um, so what about the, f the flu? Well, uh, it's a seasonal respiratory virus that can affect the upper and the lower airways. And uh, we're starting you know, flu season in the Northern Hemisphere uh, now. It's usually very abrupt, abrupt onset. Fevers, chills, muscle aches, shortness of breath, <coughs> headaches, et cetera. Usually it's self-limited, lasting a days to a week or two, like an upper respiratory infection. Uh, but in some patients, it can be quite severe and cause secondary infection or affect other uh, organs. Um, usually the treatment is just symptomatic, again, uh, fluids, rest, analgesics. Um, occasionally patients are very uh, ill and do need hospitalization. Uh, there's really no good other treatment for it. There is one medication called Tamiflu uh, that can be given that does seem to uh, decrease the severity 
and the length of the uh, illness, but just by a day or two, so it's not a great uh, treatment, and it has to be given within the first 48 hours. So if you do come down with very acutely with high fevers, muscle aches, and you think you have the flu, then you want to get evaluated right away, because after 48 hours, the medication doesn't seem to work at all. Well, what about pneumonia? That's lung inflammation of the lower respiratory tract again, but that inflames uh, the air sacs, which are the uh, little alveoli or uh, grape-like clusters in the lung where oxygen and carbon dioxide is uh, transmitted. And when they fill with fluid, it can show up as a, a shadow, which we can see on the x-ray. Most commonly, uh, pneumonias are bacterial, and the classic would be a strep pneumococcal pneumonia, which accounts for about 20% of um, the pneumonias that we see. But multiple other infections can cause pneumonia, from funguses to other uh, bacteria, some what we call atypical, like tuberculosis or Legionnaire's disease, viruses, et cetera. They all usually present similarly with cough, fever, mucus, uh, sometimes fatigue and shortness of breath. In older patients, you can present, they can present with confusion uh, or even a low temperature. Uh, but it also depends on which organism is causing the infection and if there are any comorbidities or underlying diseases that are contributing uh, to the illness. Uh, but despite all the new tests we have from blood tests to specific DNA testing and probes, still only about half of the pneumonias are, really, are identified exactly what it is. So most of the time we don't know exactly what organism is causing the problem. Well, on the right, you, on the upper part, you see the uh, sort of purplish grape-like clusters of the air sacs where oxygen and carbon dioxide is uh, <coughs> passed back and forth into the uh, circulation. And in the bottom, you see those air sacs now filled with this yellow mucus or pus. And so you can imagine not much oxygen gets picked up uh, through that air sac. It's also denser than just the upper one was just air, so that density shows up when we do an x-ray on the right as a big shadow. You can see on the um, x-ray, so the upper part of that right, uh, that x-ray shows a haziness, so that's a, a pneumonia. Pneumonia can present in different, different areas of the lung, uh, in the upper, in the middle, or in the lower part. It can be right and left, it can be both. Uh, there are some particular organisms that have more of a propensity for uh, certain areas of the lungs. So sometimes that help, that's helpful in terms of us deciding what the cause might be. As I said before, um, only about half of the time do we even diagnose exactly what uh, the infection was. And in this particular study, 46%, no pathogen was identified, so they didn't know what, what it was, and then the rest goes down. But you see the second one, strep pneumoniae, or classic pneumococcal pneumonia, it's about 20% of the pneumonias in this study, and then it goes down after that, these other less common ones, inc influenza, Haemophilus, Legionnaires, and even viruses. Uh, this graph shows us the importance of underlying disease to the severity uh, of pneumonia. And you can see on the far right, these are patients with <coughs> COPD or emphysema, and once someone with COPD gets pneumonia, their rate of hospitalization is um, multiple times, almost 10 times the uh, rate of someone without any underlying lung disease. So what's the uh, treatment? Well, usually when a patient presents with pneumonia, initially we definitely don't know what's, what's causing it. And as I said, even after we do all the testing, only half the time do we really even know. So we start with what we call a broad spectrum antibiotic. In other words, one antibiotic that sort of covers the common bacteria that we're thinking about. And then as more information comes in, we sort of fine tune our, our, uh, our treatment. Uh, depending on how sick someone is, uh, if they're walking around and breathing comfortably, we can start them on an antibiotic and send them home and have close follow-up. If they're uh, febrile or they really have a difficult time breathing or they have a lot of underlying other medical uh, diseases, they may need to be hospitalized. Uh, again, we continually uh, readjust uh, our treatment as we get more information. This graph gives us a little idea of the time frame of a successful response to treatment. Uh, as you can see, the yellow curve, the, uh, the closest to the left, shows that the, the microbiologic or uh, testing response is usually pretty quick. White blood cell goes down, probably the bacteria are, are killed, 
and then a little slower, the middle, uh, the orange curve, the clinical response uh, moves along. Patients feeling better, their oxygen's improving, they're eating, et cetera. And on the far right, the radiographic resolution. So this just suggests that the improvement on your x-ray lags. Uh, so it can take longer. So a lot of times we will see shadows on the x-ray that can linger for weeks or even months after pneumonia. Most of the time when we get another x-ray right away on a patient with pneumonia, we're really not looking for resolution. We're really looking to make sure it's not getting worse while they're on treatment because it can linger for a while. I'm going to switch uh, tax here and uh, talk about coughing which is really one of the most common reasons for a medical visit in, uh, in general medicine as well as in, in pulmonology. Um, most coughing is acute. It's from a cold, allergy, uh, some irritation. It's self-limited, goes away after a few days or a week or so. But after about eight weeks, by medical definition, they've come up with a condition. It's officially called chronic cough. It has a specific diagnosis. And when we think of someone chronic cough, cough that lasts two months or more, we're thinking of these main areas, asthma, sinus or upper airway allergies, GERD or gastroesophageal reflux, could be some other unusual lung issues, and then occasionally there are medications that can contribute to cough. Uh, the complicating factor is there's a lot of overlap. As you can see on the right in this Venn diagram between asthma, sinus, and allergies, a lot of patients will have a little bit of everything, and it's difficult to tease out which, which you're going to treat. A lot of times patients have also been to the different physicians. They've seen the allergist, they've seen the ENT doctor, they've seen the GI doctor, and they've been tried on different treatments. And then it's up to us to sort of try to piece it together and start over and tease through it and try different treatments. Uh, most of the time we will come up with the resolution of the cough, but there are a small subset of patients who have chronic cough that we never know what caused it and, and it's difficult to treat, and we'll end up just using sort of covering the cough with chronic cough medications, trying uh, even behavioral changes, speech therapy, certain things like that. Now, Dr. Wynn is going to take us through asthma. So asthma is a chronic disease of the airways, and it's characterized by a hypersensitivity or hyperreactiveness in those airways, which causes patients to have symptoms of wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, and as Dr. Sinkowitz mentioned earlier, cough. Asthma affects patients of young and old, and so oftentimes we're reminded of the you know, children having asthma and wheezing and carrying around that albuterol inhaler. And most often, that after childhood, that asthma goes into remission. But it's not that the asthma goes away, it just goes into remission, and frequently we see that it returns back again in adulthood or later in life, especially once you're over 65 years of age. Um, and especially in that population, it can become a challenge in terms of how to diagnose because there's overlapping conditions that have very similar symptoms, you know, heart failure and COPD, et cetera. Uh, the, develop of the, the development of asthma is usually a combination of genetics, uh, some sort of genetic predisposition, and environmental exposures. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. With regards to the, the management of asthma, unfortunately, there's no cure for asthma. Once you're diagnosed with asthma, once you have asthma, you're going to have it for the rest of your life. But it's something that we definitely can control. And we actually have a lot of tools to do so. Control means we control the development of asthma. We try to prevent patients from getting it. We control the triggers if patients do have asthma to prevent them from having further exacerbations. Or we control the symptoms. And with all these different tools, we can customize the treatment to each patient. It's very patient-specific based on how severe your asthma is and how well you respond to therapy. So first and foremost, um, the development of asthma. As I said, part of this is genetics. People have a predisposition to asthma. You'll see asthma sort of run in families. My, my father had it, his brother had it, my brother has it, and now I have it, right? Um, but there is actually some environmental exposures that increases your risk for asthma. Uh, here are just a few of the known environmental risk factors. Um, on the left of the screen are dust mites. These are nasty little critters that you find in your bedding. And so it's important that we try to maintain, um, you, know, you know, clean sheets, clean linens, putting, you know, these uh, um, covers over your bedding. Cockroaches are also ex uh, 
risk factors for the development of asthma. So make sure you keep your home um, cleaned up and uh, put away all the potential food sources or water sources for these nasty critters. And of course, it's going to rear its ugly head again and again throughout this lecture series. Tobacco smoke, secondhand or first line, um, is also another um, known environmental risk factor for the development of asthma. So the mainstay is we try to avoid these types of things so that you'll never develop asthma in the first place. But unfortunately, people do. And when people have asthma, typically something triggers your asthma to make it exacerbate, make it worse. These are what we call asthma triggers. And there's a number of them, from pollens to bugs in the homes, chemical fumes, pollution, cold air, dust, cigarette smoke, there it goes again, pet dander, and even stress and anger can elicit an asthmatic response. So we try to avoid those as well, but you know, certainly some of these things are unavoidable. Unfortunately, we live in California and there have been these nasty fires around, and so we have to deal with the smoke and the debris and the pollution that's around us. So what can we do? Well, the first mainstay of treatment for all asthmatics is going to be what we call a short-acting inhaler. This is that albuterol that you see the kids running around with in the, in the playgrounds. It's fast-acting, it gives quick relief, two puffs every four to six hours, and it makes you feel better. And what it acts to do is it actually will, will uh, relax the smooth muscles that are around your, your asthmatic airways. Asthma causes this hyperreactivity response where the, your smooth muscles clamp down and they narrow down your airways. It makes it hard for you to breathe. What the, what the albuterol will do is relax those smooth muscles and make your airways open up, make it easier for air to flow through. In some patients, we need long-acting inhalers. Uh, these are patients that typically would have symptoms daily or, or even more frequently sometimes. And so for those patients, we have a number of different inhalers that we can use in combination. The cornerstone of management would be your inhaled corticosteroid. You know, steroids are anti-inflammatories. They reduce the inflammation that's in your lungs, and that's a part of that hyperreactive response that I talked about earlier. Now, this isn't to be confused with oral steroids that frequently patients will tell me about how you know, they have these bad side effects, and people tell them not to take them. And it's not, definitely not to be confused with the steroids that uh, some athletes will take or to give themselves an edge. This is different. It's directed towards the lungs. It should, most of it should not get into our system, and you shouldn't have the side effects related to it. The second um, uh, long-acting inhaler type are the long-acting bronchodilators. This is a long-acting version of that short-acting inhaler that I talked about earlier, or a long-acting version of albuterol. It works in the same mechanism to relax those smooth muscles and help, op and help open up those airways. And as I said, there's a, a, a multitude of different inhalers of different combinations and different um, delivery mechanisms. And so that um, inhaler choice that you make with your physician will be very specific to you. This is a diagram of how those long-acting inhalers work. Um, the, uh, the inhaled corticosteroids will decrease this inflammation that will occur in your airways and help open up your airways. The long-acting bronchodilators will help relax these smooth muscles that have tightened down and again try to open up those airways as well. There are um, advanced therapies in asthma as well that have, are sort of cutting edge and are coming out seemingly every few months or every, every year at the very least. These are targeted therapies that require you to come into the clinic and get an infusion. And they're very specific for very, they're used for very specific patients, specific cases or specific patients with very severe disease that's refractory to our inhaler therapy. Um, these immune targeted therapies target specific cells that are part of that immune response that is a part of that uh, inflammatory response in asthma or these immune proteins called IgE that's also part of this process. Again, it's, very, it's only used in special cases. Um, bronchio, bronchial thermoplasty is also another um, sort of advanced therapy that we will sometimes turn to. In this case, using that bronchoscope that I spoke about other, um, earlier, that camera that we put into your airways, we can actually burn away those smooth muscles and force them to relax. Again, we would only use these in very severe cases that are refractory to, to medical management. So when you meet with your doctor or your pulmonologist, uh, and if you have asthma, one of the key things that we like to do is create an action plan. And this is sometimes written out in a form um, similar to this one that you see here. 
Um, it gives you an, uh, a plan as to, you know, what should I take every day? Which inhaler should I use? If my symptoms get worse, should I add on a different inhaler? Should I take oral steroids? When should I come into the office or when do I need to go to the emergency room? This again, like I said, can sometimes be written out or oftentimes we verbalize with the patient and we tell them these are our plan, this is our plan of action. And here's Dr. Sinkowitz that talked about um, COPD, asthma's brother. Well, COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is really an umbrella term covering emphysema and chronic bronchitis and sometimes even asthma to some degree. It's chronic airflow obstruction. Um, about 5% of the population in the United States is affected by it. 10% of people over 40 have COPD, and it's the third leading cause of death worldwide. So it is quite uh, uh, prevalent. And it presents, as most of other lung conditions present with, with coughing and shortness of breath. This is uh, just a quick little, again, a Venn diagram showing the overlap of emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and, and even asthma. Frequently we have patients who have asthma, but then uh, end up smoking for 20 years, so they have a combination of lung diseases thrown in there, and sometimes it's difficult to tease out. The good news in the sense for treatment is the inhalers that we'll go over in more detail that Dr. Wynn uh, just went over as well cover most of these uh, diseases. <clears throat> the most important risk factor for COPD is smoking. Nine out of 10, 90 percent are, are from basically smoking. There are some occupational uh, exposures that can contribute to COPD. Air pollution is felt to contribute uh, some, or at least definitely exacerbations. And there's some genetic component, uh, some that we know about and some that we, we don't. Basically, you need spirometry uh, or breathing function tests to make the diagnosis to assess if the patient has airflow obstruction and the severity of it. This is a little picture of what happens in the lungs at the top of those normal, those little alveoli that we showed about in pneumonia, again, nice and round and clean. And at the bottom, um, you can see here that the, all the sort of side, the walls and structure are somewhat destroyed and it's sort of like a floppy bag. Well, that's what it's like uh, with emphysema. You sort of have these floppy uh, lungs with air trapped in them. This is a, a chest x-ray uh, of a patient with severe emphysema uh, and basically just showing um, what you have here are these what we call hyperinflated lungs, this big black space which is air and you see the heart in the middle is usually a little bigger. It's been sort of compressed because of the, the swollen uh, lungs that are hyperinflated. The diaphragms are flattened and on the side view there's a lot of air here below behind the sternum and you basically end up with uh, some a barrel chest. This is a really advanced case of someone who has severe emphysema and a lot of air trapping. These are the pictures or the curves that we get from the spirometry test that we do in terms of what we call a flow volume loop. And basically it's just showing the volume you can voluntarily blow out. And just to sort of a, you don't have to really interpret it, but just a uh, quick, you can see over here normal, the area under this curve and then with emphysema, you see the curve smaller and smaller and smaller, less and less volume is blown out, which seems paradoxical compared to these big hyperinflated, hyperexpanded lungs, but less comes out, so it's all trapped in there. This is just a, sort of a curve of lung function. And basically, uh, unfortunately for all of us, um, on this axis is what's called the FEV1, or how much air you can blow out in the first second versus time and age. And it starts at 25 because that's where the downhill swing starts for all of us. <laughs> the lungs are growing and maturing up until about 25, and then after that it's just a slow downhill course. But it is somewhat slow here. Someone who's never smoked or not susceptible to smoke, their lung function declines ever so slowly. Someone who smokes regularly, you can see this rapid, steep uh, decline. Uh, and um, the good news is for patients who stop smoking is that when you stop smoking, you don't return to normal, but your curve returns to the normal angle. So it's a much slower decline. So it's always, even in advanced cases, uh, it's always good to stop smoking, no matter what. So you don't say, I've smoked for 50 years, uh, it's, uh, I'm too old to give it up. No, you can always stop and uh, you'll still have uh, some improvement. This also shows on, on this axis uh, when the symptoms start. So we have a lot of reserve uh, in our bodies, especially the lungs. 
So you lose about half your lung function in some cases before you develop symptoms. So that's why when people come in and they say they're smoking and they feel okay, so it hasn't hit them yet. And we say, well, there's a starting to show some decline in your lung function, you should you know, stop now. You definitely wanna stop. You don't wanna wait for symptoms to start because by that time you've lost a lot of lung function. This, just, this is sort of the same uh, curve, but shows here that uh, what are called exacerbations. So uh, people with uh, chronic obstructive lung disease frequently get what we call exacerbations. They're hospitalized for recurrent episodes of infection or exacerbations because of, we're seeing a lot of it now with the uh, fires going on and smoke, they're coming in and they're having more shortness of breath on top of their usual baseline shortness of breath. And every time someone gets an exacerbation, it's thought there's a little bit of loss of lung function so that curve is even faster the more frequent exacerbations. So this uh, becomes important in terms of treatment uh, despite trying to uh, prevent COPD and lung disease by stopping smoking or avoidance of those exposures and treating someone to maintain their uh, symptoms as little as possible, we have to figure out a way to reduce exacerbations as well, which contributes to uh, lung function decline. This is just a sampling of uh, probably most of the inhalers, but not all of them we have available. Uh, and it's nice, we have this at our office, it's nice to show the patients they can pick out which inhaler they're on, because many times people can't remember. And we can sort of just give a, a quick overview. Um, as Dr. Oops, as Dr. Wynn mentioned, we have the short-acting inhalers, there's long-acting inhalers, there's inhaled corticosteroids, and then there's all these sort of combinations. So they mix and match, the different companies have come up with different uh, delivery systems as well. There's the classic sprays, uh, there are powders, and there are the newer mists. Uh, and each, each have their own sort of mechanism to delivery and correct way to use it. So in addition to compliance, in other words, making sure uh, you're taking your medications regularly, you wanna make sure you're using them correctly. Because it's easy to swallow a pill most of the time but uh, sometimes if you're not using the inhaler correctly, you're not getting much uh, medication. So how do we treat uh, COPD? Uh, initially, the most important is stopping smoking. It's over and over and over and over again. Then we'll start with the bronchodilators, uh, open up the bronchial tubes, uh, short acting and long acting. Then we might advance to, in addition to the inhaled steroids. Uh, Pulmonary rehab uh, is a great program. It's basically it's sort of an exercise program. Most hospitals, Torrance has one, little company has one. Most hospitals offer this service. It's covered by Medicare. Uh, it's usually a six week, twice, uh, six week but, and twice a week program. And then they have a maintenance program that people can stay on after that. And basically within that program, they'll have lectures on lung disease, proper breathing techniques, stress reduction, proper use of your inhalers, uh, and you exercise under monitored conditions so you have some uh, confidence, you're not concerned about you know, just getting on the treadmill at home if something's gonna happen, you're there, you're being monitored, et cetera. And it's definitely been shown in, in studies uh, to um, <coughs> decrease shortness of breath, improve exercise capacity, and even in study, some studies to decrease mortality. Sometimes we get to the point someone needs oxygen. Uh, now remember, not all shortness of breath is caused by low oxygen. So they need to be tested and checked. There are certain criteria that have come up with from studies about patients, what level of oxygen you'll benefit from, and therefore the insurance companies and Medicare have adopted that, and if you don't hit those levels, they're not gonna pay for it. Uh, and you probably don't need it. That's, and then last, in rare cases, there is surgery for people who have COPD. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, those big, hyper-expanded, floppy lungs don't function well. So sometimes the surgeons have gone in and basically taken out pieces of lung to make them effectively smaller and they function a little better. Uh, we also occasionally will put valves in through the bronchoscope, one-way valves that will decrease airflow obstruction as well. And then obviously the ultimate would be a lung transplant in certain patients. Most of the time, a lot of patients with COPD are gonna be older and then that would preclude having lung transplant because their age uh, criteria. I'm going to uh, switch tax a little bit here and go into bronchiectasis, a term some people may or may not have heard of. Um, sorry. And so usually that uh, starts with an infection with some incomplete resolution. It could have been even an infection from childhood. 
and you end up with permanent abnormal widening and destruction of the airways, leading to increased mucus. Uh, and as more mucus forms, it impairs drainage, causes more obstruction, and it starts a vicious cycle. Uh, and obviously with more mucus forming, patients cough. So usually patients will present with chronic cough with lots of mucus. So what's really happening here? On the right, on this uh, cartoon pictorial, we see these uh, airways that are dilated. Uh, and then on, this is an actual CAT scan uh, or slice uh, down the middle of a patient with uh, bronchiexis. So this is the, the, uh, their chest, this is their spine, um, and this is the windpipe in the middle. And uh, then you see all these dilated airways that are thickened and scarred and accumulating mucus. Uh, so you can imagine it becomes difficult to breathe and then lots and lots of uh, mucus. Well, just to bring a uh, literary reference uh, to medicine, uh, there's been a lot of uh, lay articles over the years in magazines from the New Yorker to the Atlantic, uh, even Newsweek, uh, about healthy women who presented with chronic cough for months or years, going doctor to doctor, and then eventually being diagnosed with a certain type of bacteria that we call non-tuberculosis mycobacterium, or NTB, or other people will call it atypical tuberculosis. Uh, it's been called Lady Windermere Syndrome, which re refers to a character in an Oscar Wilde play called uh, Lady Windermere's Fan, uh, and it references a, a thin, well-mannered woman, very polite, who suppresses her cough. And it was postulated that patients, uh, women who were suppressing their cough, contributed to mucus accumulation and therefore infection and sort of a downhill course, they would uh, end up with this particular uh, bacteria that happens to be basically everywhere. It's uh, ubiquitous, it's in the soil and the water, usually doesn't cause a problem except in patients with underlying lung disease or immune problems such as HIV, but there are a certain uh, group of patients, especially uh, women who seem with no history of lung problems who develop this. <clears throat> and then so it picked up this name of Lady Windermere Syndrome. The cough suppression hypothesis of suppressing your cough has never been proven, so. Um, <clears throat> uh, Non-tuberculosis mycobacterium is in the same family as mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes tuberculosis, and mycobacterium leprae, which causes leprosy, but it's a different species. It doesn't cause any, it's not contagious human to human, uh, and doesn't usually cause as much lung destruction, although it can in certain cases. Uh, the problem with it is sometimes it's difficult to find. Even though it's everywhere in the soil, it's sometimes hard to grow in the lab uh, from a patient specimen. Uh, and when it does grow, it can take a long time, weeks to months. Uh, so sometimes it's difficult to diagnose. Uh, it's also very difficult to treat. As a very slow growing organism, it doesn't replicate that quickly. So therefore bacteria, I mean antibiotics will take a long time and the treatment is usually several antibiotics over a long period of time, even one to two years. So a lot of patients can't tolerate uh, that kind of treatment. So as I said, bronchiexis uh, usually presents with a chronic cough. Usually you need a chest x-ray or a chest CT scan to look for the classic changes in scarring and dilated bronchial tubes that we uh, sh showed in the picture. Uh, usually uh, we want to get some sputum cultures to see if there's active infection that we would need to treat. Sometimes you may need to do a bronchoscopy to obtain those specific cultures. Um, we'll treat the specific uh, infection that we find, uh, but most importantly ends up being airway clearance. These patients will usually bring up copious amounts of mucus uh, and they'll be on bronchodilators, mucolytics or medications that break up the mucus, and mobilization techniques to get the mucus out. Some of the techniques would be the old-fashioned banging on someone's back to loosen up the mucus. Uh, and now they have these uh, vibration uh, vest chest devices uh, that are on the market um, that you sit down twice a day and it vibrates for a half hour, loosens the mucus, and, and you cough it out. And lastly, uh, there's this uh, little device called a PEP, or positive airway uh, pressure and what happens is when you exhale, uh, there's a little bit of a resistance valve, and so it causes air to back up, and that air backing up is a shear force and causes the mucus uh, to move forward. You can clear it out. Some patients might use this a few times a day. 
So enough about obstructive lung diseases. Now we're going to discuss what we call restrictive lung diseases. So it goes by many names, restrictive lung diseases, or pulmonary fibrosis, or interstitial lung disease, scarring of the lungs. Um, and essentially, this is a grouping of uh, different lung diseases that are outside of the airways. So far, we've been talking a lot about different airway-related di diseases, but this is more about the, the other structures in your lungs, or the scaffolding of your lungs, that um, can oftentimes become inflamed and develop inflammation. Um, these terms, pulmonary fibrosis or uh, interstitial lung disease or restrictive lung diseases, they're all umbrella terms for many different types of diseases that can cause inflammation in the lungs or, or, and or scarring in the lungs. Um, uh, certain autoimmune diseases such as lupus or scleroderma, Sjogren's or rheumatoid arthritis can cause inflammation in your body. You know, most of the people think about these diseases as causing joint issues or joint pains, but that inflammation carries throughout the body and into the lungs as well. And any time that you have inflammation in one spot that lingers on for a long time, that can cause the formation of scar tissue, and that can occur inside of the lungs. Other things that can cause long-standing inflammation will cause similar issues, such as, you know, uh, long-standing infections. Um, chronic aspiration where food contents or saliva or the acids in your stomach go into your lungs and sit there for a while, that can cause inflammation and scarring in the lungs. Certain medications can cause inflammation and scarring in the lungs. Exposures, um, whether occupational or environmental, can cause inflammation in the lungs and lead to um, an interstitial lung disease such as hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Radiation exposure from uh, various treatments of cancers can cause it, and there are also unknown reasons or idiopathic reasons for pulmonary fibrosis. And that one's a bit special because um, in that situation, uh, there doesn't seem to be this precursor of, inf of inflammation, and you have to treat it a little bit differently. So when we see patients who come in with restrictive lung diseases, again, it goes back to the same evaluation techniques that I spoke of earlier. We talk to the patient, we ask them about whether or not they've had exposures in their life or whether they've had chronic infections. How do they swallow? Do they have issues swallowing? Does it seem like they choke very often? Do they have uh, radiations in the past? Or do they have any of these autoimmune diseases such as scleroderma or Sjogren's or rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera? And we look in through your medical list to see if there's any medications that may be cause, causing you to have these issues. We will also evaluate you by taking a look at your lung function. How bad is this um, restrictive lung disease? And ultimately, we'll get a high-resolution CT scan to look at your lung tissue in great detail to see what pattern of lung disease is occurring. Very frequently, we can make a diagnosis through the CT scan alone, um, just looking at the different pattern as we, of how this inflammation is occurring. But very frequently as well, we'll have to turn to our surgical colleagues and ask them if they can get a biopsy of your lung and take a look at it under the microscope to see what may be causing these symptoms to arise or this phenomenon to occur. Here you'll see a very characteristic CT scan of someone with very extensive pulmonary fibrosis or scarring. The lungs are most often described as almost spongy and characteristic. You know, uh, and especially as a, like a, when you get a new sponge fresh from the package, you'll notice that it's, it returns its former shape very easily as you s squeeze on it, and it can fill up with a lot of water. Well, that's how a lung should be. It f it's very squeezy, it returns to its original shape, and can take up a lot of air. Unfortunately, um, when you get scarring of the lungs, it's, it turns into sort of a sponge that's been left out to dry for too long. It's not as compliant as it used to be. It doesn't return to its old shape as well. And when you try to put water into it, it doesn't hold as much water. In this case, it's not holding as much air. And so what you see here on the CT scan is all this area of scarring that's kind of you know, developed in these lungs and it's become very stiff. And this is what we call honeycomb changes. It looks almost like a honeycomb pattern. That's very characteristic of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. The management of uh, interstitial lung disease can be a whole lecture in itself because there's so many different ways in which uh, people can develop interstitial lung disease and there's very different disease processes that they incur. But there are a few mainstays. Number one is, of course, smoking exposure. You gotta quit smoking. Again, it's a, a theme that we're gonna come back to again and again. 
Um, and that exercise or pulmonary rehab program that Dr. Sinkowitz talked about, that is also essential in patients with interstitial lung disease. Those programs help improve your body's ability to tolerate exercise. It teaches you how to breathe, what techniques you can use, and helps improve your exercise capacity and your tolerance. I always tell patients that if your body is more efficient at using oxygen, you don't rely so heavily on those scarred lungs that you had before. So you want your body to be more like a Prius, right? Real efficient. You don't want it to be that gas guzzler up there. So make sure that you keep on exercising, use pulmonary rehabilitation, and get that body to be as efficient as possible using the oxygen that your lungs can provide for you. Beyond those types of things, um, it becomes very disease specific. For most of this, these diseases that I spoke of earlier, we're gonna use anti-inflammatories or steroids to try to reduce that inflammation. Like I said before, inflammation that settles in one area will cause scarring. And so with steroids, you can reduce the inflammation in hopes that you, don't, um, you prevent further scarring to occur. Now there's only one exception, and that's idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Unfortunately, IPF is a disease where it doesn't seem like inflammation is a precursor. In these patients, we try to use agents, or these new agents, actually, they only came out in 2014, um, called perfenidone, also known as Esbrit, or nintedinib, also known as OFEV, that will help stop scarring at that, um, uh, without uh, the inflammation. It stops the scarring process. It helps slow down the rate of disease because it helps slow down this process of scarring, but um, ultimately it doesn't improve your lung function, unfortunately. In very severe cases of interstitial lung disease, um, we have to turn to lung transplantation. Another disease that's outside of the airways are blood clots. Now blood clots can form um, in patients um, for a variety of reasons. Um, Sometimes patients have a genetic predisposition because there's an alteration in their body's ability to balance out how thick or thin your blood should be. Um, sometimes infections or certain inflammatory diseases can also alter that. And even malignancies or cancers can alter your body's ability to um, keep that blood nice and thin and not clot up. Very frequently we'll see that patients will have one of these predispositions and also um, have a lot of immobility. Our body helps circulate um, blood through your system by our muscles contraction, our movements, etc. And if so, if someone were to remain immobilized for quite a period of time, that blood doesn't move as well and it's more likely to form into a clot. Now, clots can form anywhere, but very frequently we'll see them either in the extremities, um, very frequently in, our, in the legs, um, or in the arms and that's called a deep vein thrombosis, or DVT. When that clot travels up and gets into your lungs, that's when we call it a pulmonary embolism. Now there are certain symptoms of blood clots that we all need to be aware of. In DVTs, you'll have pain in that extremity. Again, most often it's occurring in the legs, so you have leg pain, warmth in that area, or swelling. When it travels up to your lungs, it can cause shortness of breath, a sharp pain in your chest, Maybe sometimes patients will have a cough with a little bit of blood in it, and you'll feel that heart racing or, pal or you'll have heart palpitations. If you have these types of symptoms, you need to seek medical attention very quickly and get um, uh, some additional testing. Um, for deep vein thrombosis, you need an ultrasound of that extremity that's warm, inflamed, and swollen. And if, you are con if the doctor's concerned about pulmonary embolism, you'll need a CT scan of the lungs. Treatment for it is actually pretty simple. We thin out that blood and we help prevent you from getting more clots. Sometimes patients will only need to be on blood thinners for about three months. In some cases, if you have a strong predisposition to clots or you have recurrent clots, you'll need to be on blood thinners for the rest of your life. Okay, I know this has been a uh, real fast uh, overview of pulmonary medicine in half an hour, uh, but we'd be remiss if we didn't discuss a little bit about uh, prevention well, we all know what uh, this is. Hopefully everybody here has had this ritual recently. Uh, and uh, basically their, their yearly flu shot. Um, influenza is, is a virus, uh, it's a, a seasonal virus. Uh, epidemics occur every year. And what happens is that this particular virus, the surface characteristics change every year and therefore they try to uh, guess in advance, or the CDC does anyway, what uh, the surface is gonna be like and develop a vaccine that'll 
hopefully control the virus for that year. It's hit or miss, sometimes they're accurate, sometimes not. But even if they're off, it will definitely uh, help some. So overall, it decreases the risk of influenza and the severity of the disease. Uh, it's recommended for everyone over age six months. Usually it's recommended by the end of October in, in the Northern Hemisphere, which we are, but it's never too late to get it. So far this year, it's been a light flu season uh, so far, but that could change at any minute. Uh, there's a high dose uh, vaccine that's recommended for patients 65 years of old uh, or older. Um, the standard flu vaccine is inactivated or killed virus. Uh, so you don't get the flu from the flu vaccine. You can get aches and muscle pains, and especially in the area of injection, but you don't get influenza. Uh, there are uh, what we call weak or, or um, live attenuated but weakened viruses in the intranasal or flu mist, which was popular for a while, but it's uh, usually not given that often. Some people who are really fearful of needles might uh, get that. Uh, it's definitely not for pregnant women or anyone who has a reduced immune system. Uh, and basically the goal overall of mass vaccinations is not only to help an individual uh, prevent or reduce the severity of flu if they get it, but also the whole community to decrease the spread. Uh, so that's why it's important that uh, everyone gets the, uh, the flu shot. Uh, another one quickly to go over is the Pneumovax. So Pneumovax does not mean, it's not a pneumonia vaccine. The pneumo is for pneumococcal pneumonia, and specifically uh, for strep pneumonia. As I mentioned earlier, remember, about half the pneumonias, we don't know what they are, but 20% happen to be streptococcal pneumonia. So that's why they came up with this particular vaccine to try to reduce uh, the incidence of that. Uh, the problem with this uh, bacteria is it has about 90 different subtypes on its surface, uh, but some of them are more commonly associated with pneumonia, and that's what they've uh, come up with. Um, the standard Pneumovax, which is called the PPSV23 vaccine, covers about 23 of the most common subtypes in adults. It was initially uh, released in 1970, at that time, it only had about 14 subtypes, but it's been in improved since then to 23 subtypes. And it's recommended for anybody over 65 and for patients who are high risk if they do get pneumococcal pneumonia uh, for, to get it or to have complications from it. Then there's uh, uh, oops, the other vaccine, the Prevnar 13, which you may have heard about now, the second pneumonia vaccine out there, or a pneumococcal vaccine anyway. Uh, and this was initially developed for, for children, because it turns out the classic pneumovax can't be given to children under two, because uh, it doesn't seem to work. They don't develop an immune response for it. So they came out with this, a children's vaccine. Initially, uh, it covered seven, now up to 13 of the subtypes. Initially, it was released in the year 2000. Uh, but it was also uh, found to be helpful in adults who have underlying uh, risk factors. Uh, so as I said, the, uh, the standard Pneumovax is recommended for anyone over 65 and conditions that place them at a high risk of infection. Just to uh, have a quick, quick chart about this, because sometimes it's confusing. A lot of patients go to their primary care doctor and they come into us. They've had one vaccine. Should they get the other? When should they get it? Just a quick overview. The standard um, Pneumovax vaccine, everybody over 65 is recommended should get. Anyone who has more severe dis underlying diseases that put them at risk of bad pneumonia or getting pneumonia, cancer, renal failure, transplant, or immune deficiency. Patients who are at definite or higher risk overall, smokers, uh, COPD, heart disease, diabetes. Uh, and it's recommended that they be revaccinated after age 65 every five to 10 years. For the Prevnar 13, initially a children's vaccine, remember, is now re recommended by some uh, groups for all adults over 65. It's a little controversial, not that there's any downside to it, but some of the studies are not very um, uh, <coughs> strong in terms of showing that it's that beneficial once you've already had that. But the overall recommendations have been to to give that to over 65. And it's also given for people who have high risk. For standard, for younger patients who are just smokers or COPD, it's not recommended. And there's never, you're never revaccinated. Once you've had it, you don't get it anymore. The only other thing to mention is uh, 
you can get both vaccines, the pneumonia vax, the pneumovax, and the influenza vaccine at the same time, just in a different injection site. So don't ha you don't have to wait any time in between. There is some different timing between these two vaccines. Um, if you've had this one already, you have to wait a year before getting this one. Uh, if you've never had either and your doctor wants to give you both of them, you, they recommend this one first and then this one about eight weeks later. But that's something that you can go over with your uh, uh, physician. So remember, this is, it's important to get vaccinated, obviously seasonally for influenza, the pneumonia vaccine, but or I, I even say pneumonia vaccine, there's a pneumococcal vaccine. So remember, this vaccine, people are always coming in saying, I, I couldn't have gotten pneumonia, I had the pneumonia vaccine. This only covers, at most, 20% of the possible pneumonias that you might get. Um, the other 80% uh, are, are not being covered by this. So uh, most of the time, you know, uh, it, it's better than nothing. So we recommend it. And then Dr. Wing's gonna take us through the other uh, important prevention measures. So I think uh, we're about to beat a dead horse here, but um, really, you know, smoking cessation is, is really one of the most important things that we can't stress any further. And I'd, re I'd be remiss of talking about smoking cessation without giving a, uh, a shout out to Wendy in the back there and our smoking cessation um, program. You know, I always tell patients, um, you talk to an alcoholic or an opiate user, you, you tell them you need help. You need to find a support group. You need to find rehab. You need to find a structured support system in which you can overcome your addiction. And it, it, it baffles my mind that we don't think the same way about nicotine, which is a, a very addictive drug, um, in some cases more addictive than the ones I've just mentioned. And so uh, it's almost a no-brainer for anyone who's smoking that they should be a part of a smoking cessation program. Um, participants who are involved in a program like this are six times more likely to be able to quit um, cigarette smoke um, than those who try on their own. Up to 60% of individuals who um, are participants of this program will have quit smoking by the end of the program. There you'll learn about um, the different physical, mental, and social aspects of, of their addiction and how to address it. And, and you really will get immediate health benefits by quitting smoking. So. Um, I, I really have to uh, give, a, give a shout out to Wendy and, and, and that program. And also, um, since I'm talking about Wendy, um, our lung cancer screening program for patients who are long-term smokers, um, they should be screened for lung cancer because it will save your life. And I think it's a great segue into our next speaker, um, Dr. Fuller, who I think Dr. Miller will be introducing very shortly. Thank you very much. So Dr. Fuller is uh, going to join us and uh, be coming up as I introduce him. Uh, Dr. Clark Fuller is a board certified by the American Board of Thoracic Surgery. He possesses extensive experience in minimally invasive thoracic surgery with expertise in lung cancer and lung metastases screening and treatment, esophageal cancer and motility disorders, disease of the thymus, aerodigestive tract stenting, and chest walls tumors. Dr. Fuller has contributed immensely to the medical field, authoring numerous chapters and articles in thoracic surgery textbooks, and is involved with several medical societies, including the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. Dr. Fuller is also a key investigator with the major oncologic clinical trial groups CALBG and ASCOG, and serves as a medical consultant for the Jet Propulsion, Propulsion Laboratory's Early Detection of Lung Cancer Project. After receiving his bachelor's degree from the University of Wyoming, Dr. Fuller attended medical school at Creighton University in Omaha. He completed a general surgery residency at the University of Missouri followed by a residency in cardiothoracic surgery at the University of Southern California uh, at the Los Angeles County and Children's Hospitals of Los Angeles. Dr. Fuller then completed additional specialty training with a fellowship in esophageal surgery at the University of Southern California, followed by a second fellowship in thoracic surgery, surgical oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson K 
Cancer Center, where he specialized in medically in minimally invasive surgical techniques. Please welcome Dr. Fuller. Holy cow. No wonder I'm so old. It took me so long to get here. I, uh, it's uh, really funny. My parents continued to ask me, said, when, when are you going to be done? You know, how much longer is this going to go on? And what I would tell them is what my professors told me. And they would say, there's no better investment than in yourself. And a year here, two years here, you develop a passion. You're, you, you love what you're doing. You can share that with your patients, and people recognize it immediately. So I don't regret one iota that my first job was when I was 37 years old. Okay? <laughs> that said, you're going to notice immediately that I'm not going to put up slides. Now, if they want to turn up the lights a little bit, they can. Because when you're the last speaker, I've learned two important questions, you know? Don't make it too dark and don't talk too long, all right? <laughs> so we got it. we're going to move along. It's what I am going to talk about, and I, and I want to just congratulate my colleagues here. I'm privileged to be able to come down here. I'm the Associate Director of Thoracic Surgery at Cedars-Sinai, and as you see, there's been a new alliance, a new affiliation between these two in institutions, and I truly believe that it's a, it's a symbiotic thing in that it's one plus one equals four. And I, I get to work with, with pe people like these guys. Another thing I should tell you right off the bat is, is that occasionally I stutter, and I do it well. Don't worry about it. I don't worry about it. We'll work through it, okay? <laughs> so don't be nervous for me. Um, but as, a, as, a, as an example of this, it, it is, we've been able to take each institution and, and, and accomplish things that neither one could without the other. And, and at the spear point of this, I think, is, is our thoracic oncology program, or the way we treat and deal with cancer of the lung in the South Bay here. Make no mistake about it. Lung cancer is a major health issue. It remains, to date, the number one cancer killer worldwide. The numbers, if I said them, are staggering in the hundreds of thousands of new cases that are diagnosed each year. What is even more alarming to me is that we're seeing an increasingly number of cases in people that have had a trivial exposure to smoke or have never smoked. It's always been associated, if you smoke and you get lung can cancer, you sort of, you know, you kind of ask for it. That's not the case at all anymore, particularly in women. Of the people that have never smoked and developed cancer of the lung, two-thirds of those are women, and they're less than 60 years of age. The other reason I bring this up is that most women that age, their primary care comes from a gynecologist, who unfortunately are not as well versed as a, these doctors here in the treatment and diagnosis and anticipating a potential pro pro problem. The other thing that we, we need to understand is that despite those numbers, despite the mortality associated with cancer of the lung, it is and will be a very curable disease based on one thing, early detection. You think of any of the malignancies, any cancers that we've had success with, colon, prostate, breast, every one of those are associated with a very good screening program. To date, we now have a very good screening program for cancer of the lung, and that's the CT scan of the chest. It's been validated not only by studies done in the United States, but also recently abroad in Europe, that the CT scan of the chest in appropriately selected high-risk individuals has a greater than 20 to 30% chance of reducing mortality associated with cancer of the lung. The CT scan of the chest, or excuse me, the CT of the chest is to lung cancer what the mammogram 
was to breast cancer. It's the exact corollary. And that's what we need to do. We do not have, unfortunately, our organs are not outwardly examined. You can't feel, you can't touch. You listen, you get x-rays, okay? But before, uh, when people begin to have uh, symptoms of cancer of the lung, you heard cough, that's a very generic thing. They notice blood in, in the sputum, weight loss, okay? Over half of those patients, if they have a cancer of the lung, it is beyond what we can really treat effectively medically. If we shift that paradigm, if we catch patients, if we see patients, if we find patients before those symptoms ever arise, we can treat them effectively with a greater than 80%. I'm gonna reiterate that, 80% chance of cure. We talk about stage, a stage of disease. Stage is, is, is otherwise said extent, meaning where it is and where it's not. Cancers of the lung that are found on a screening CT of the chest have a very high likelihood of being in early stage, meaning stage one, which are extremely curable with aggressive surgical intervention, usually do not need uh, follow-up chemotherapy and or radiation. So the, the, if, if there's nothing else that comes from this meeting right now, actually there's two things. There's number one is that there is an effective therapy and treatment for cancer of the lung. And the nihilism of the past should be abolished. Number two is that a smoking history is with a patient forever. After about 10 years af after you've quit, your chances of developing a cancer of the lung begin to level off, maybe even decrease a little bit. But it will never, ever be the same had you never smoked. And that's information that needs to be shared with your pulmonologist, with your primary care physician. That it's because you quit doesn't make the risk stop. Having that history, whether personally or whether from secondhand exposures as a child, that will help trip or flip the light switch with your primary care physician that maybe a screening CT can and should be done. Most insurance companies will cover the cost of a screening CT. Most hospitals, this one included, with a very aggressive screening program, even if you do not qualify for a screening CT based on your insurance, offer one at an incredibly affordable price, usually around $200, which in, in the world of medicine is, is remarkable, okay? So I, 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 I emphasize that because when we go to intervene, that's everything. Another point here is that Torrance is very, very blessed in that we have a remarkable resource in the form of the Hunt Cancer Institute. As part of that, each and every Friday, myself, my pulmonary colleagues, radiologist, radiation oncologist, oncologist, uh, our nurse navigators, everybody gather together in what we call a tumor board. And what that really means is it, it represents a multidisciplinary approach to this pro problem in that we, we discuss, we diagnose, we impl implement a therapeutic plan for patients that have early or even maybe even later stages cancer of the lung. The benefit that this community reaps from that is that this, this collection of physicians that have dedicated themselves to the treatment and study of cancer of the lung advances their, their treatment, it advances the rate at which things are being treated, and it's remarkable. Having been at several institutions, as she, you know, to my you know, chagrin, went, went through, this place has one of the best tumor boards I've ever been a part of, and that is an extremely important cog in treating cancers of the lung. What do we do? Well. After we identify what we consider would be a high-risk patient with a high-risk finding on a chest x-ray that led to a CAT scan, there's a complete 
radiographic evaluation. We then consider them, are they or are they not a candidate for surgical intervention? Surgical intervention to be successful in cancers of, of the lung needs to be directed at the patient population that will most benefit from it. And those are people with early stage disease, meaning that the cancer itself is confined to a single spot, usually within the lung. It has not gone anywhere else. We learned a long time ago, I, I grew up on a ranch in Wyoming, and uh, my dad would tell me, he says, you know, it didn't do much good to close that barn door after the horse is gone. And he was absolutely right. And, and it's the, the same thing works when we're dealing with a can cancer of the lung, particularly with an operation. Our goal at surgery is to complete eradication and removal of the tumor. Fortunately, we can be remarkably successful with that when it's isolated to a single area of the lung. What has changed dramatically in the last 15 years has been how do we get to it? How do you get inside there to get this thing out? Traditionally, and in, and in at least 60% of the hospitals in the United States, entry into the chest cavity is gained through a fairly large incision on the side that requires a spreading of the ribs, and you go in and you remove this thing. It's remarkably uh, successful, it's remarkably well tolerated, and it also takes a remarkably long time to recover from. That's not what we do here. 98% of the lung cancer cases that are done at Torrance Memorial, as well as my practice at Cedars Sinai, are done with a minimally invasive approach. Minimally invasive approach to the chest cavity can be one of two different ways. Number one is what we call VATS, V-A-T-S. It stands for Video Assisted Thoracic Surgery. What this means is we have borrowed what, what the orthopods have been doing for quite a while, what the general surgeons have done for quite a while, in that we take a, a scope with a light at the end that's able to put a picture, a high definition picture on a TV screen through a little incision. We make two other little incisions on the side of the chest that give us access for our instruments and we can go in and successfully diagnose and at the, usually at the same time treat do the, what we call an anatomic <coughs> resection, meaning we take out not only the cancer, but the lobe of the lung or the portion of the lung that it resides in. We know that that gives the patient their very best chance of cure and it minimizes the chance of local recurrence, i.e. of it coming back. Another method of minimally in accessing the inside of the chest cavity is the use of the robot. I think people hear the word robot and they think the robot is doing the operation, and it is not. It is an extension of my hands. I've been fortunate enough to work uh, up in uh, Sunnyvale, California, uh, and Torrance Memorial has the, uh, the, our, a robot here as well, too. And it's very interesting. I'd love, uh, we're going to have a meeting later on in the year that you can actually sit down and, and look at one. And what it basically is, is that I sit at a console here, and I look into things like that giant viewfinder that you used to do and click and, and look through things. I look at it here and between my hands and my feet with the patient and the actual robot over there, I can manipulate, we can look in and you the, the visualization and the representation of what you see inside the chest cavity is remarkable. And it enables me to do a very precise anatomic operation through a series of three or four little incisions on the patient's side. What that, trans what that means to you is that opposed to an operation that keeps you in the hospital, the average length of stay with a big incision on the side is nine days. Our average length of stay is 2.3. And the reason is that minimally invasive. When people can get out of the hospital quicker, they, re they, they recover more fully and more quickly their return to work, their return to function, and should they need any additional therapies, they're much better shape in order to tolerate that than if they had gone, gone through a larger ar operation. Excuse me. The, com the combination of Cedars-Sinai and Torrance has been able for doing 
all these people together, from the pulmonologist to the radiation oncologist to the surgeons. And the advantage is it to the community is remarkable. And I'm, I'm very proud to be a part of that. The other thing I want to talk about is that in addition, and this is kind of the future of where we're going, surgery really in con conceptually is very archaic. And it means you go in, you remove something, and you take it out. The Egyptians were doing that 3,000 years ago. It works for cancer because you remove the tumor, hopefully, in, in its totality. What we've now discovered and are working through is that cancers are as individual as the patient is. They generally have even individual genetic or DNA sequences within that tumor that help us treat them long after it's been removed. When we have that tumor tissue and we can study the specific DNA sequences within that tumor itself, it helps us not only at the time that the surgery is done, but in the future, should there be any evidence of recurrence or development of metastatic disease. That field, what we call tumor markers, is mushrooming. It is, it is dramatically different than what it was even five years ago. As a matter of fact, we're, we're at the point right now where there is a significant study that, that people here in the South Bay will have access to that if somebody is not a candidate for surgery, meaning that, that their health would preclude them from undergoing an operation, that we can treat them with a very focal, limited source of radiation and a type of medication that they take by pill, and the results, early results, are remarkable, are absolutely astounding. So it is, it's, it's, a, it's a process. It is it's certainly a, a work in progress that you all are involved with, we are involved, involved, involved with, and even in my relatively short career, I think, uh, things have changed dramatically from big incisions, long hospitalizations, prolonged recoveries, to minimally invasive robotic interventions, and now coupling that with looking at specific DNA markers, making a disease problem as individual as the patient themselves, and not saying, well, this is a cancer of the lung, therefore we have to do this. It is, it is moving, it's moving quickly, and Torrance is a part of that, and that's something that I'm remarkably proud of, and you all should be remarkably proud of. Before I stop, I wanna say thank you to each and every one of you for taking the time and the effort and the energy to come out here on a, what is it, Wednesday night? I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I had a full day in the OR, and, I'm, and I apologize. See how sharp they are? I get to work all day in my pajamas. I really, I'm sorry I was a little bit late. But taking the time and the effort and the attentiveness, and the attentiveness to come out here and listen, these guys gave you a tremendous amount of information, almost a tsunami amount, and it, it is, it, it's fantastic. If any qu questions were to come up, I'd be happy to an an answer them, either up here or personally on, on, on the side. But that's going to conclude my remarks tonight. We'll get you out of here a little bit earlier than 9, nine o'clock. So thank you very much. All right. So now we're going to take about a five-minute break, and that leaves everybody a chance to um, write up some questions. Uh, the Miracle of Living Committee folks will be handing out pen pencils and pieces of paper. Write the questions down. Um, we always like to give the questions from up here because this is being taped and it just doesn't pick up questions well from the audience. So we'll direct your questions to the uh, committee and then after about a five minute break, we're gonna go ahead and see how smart our panel really is. All right, so we're gonna start off um, uh, with some questions that I expected that we would probably see. Uh, we have a number of, of questions regarding the risk of smoking marijuana and vaping. This is a, a, a common question I hear. When patients are asked if they smoke, they say no. And they have this misconception that somehow marijuana is organic, it's natural, and it doesn't have the same risk of factors as associated with tobacco. Well. 
they didn't take a very good botany class because tobacco is also natural. It's a plant, uh, and there's nothing organic or non-carcinogenic about marijuana smoke. As a matter of fact, there's already been over 200 potentially carcinogenic uh, chemicals identified in marijuana smoke. The entire goal of it, when you inhale marijuana is to take in as much as you can and hold it in for as long as you can through a totally unfiltered system. So it is, it is remarkably uh, not safe. Uh, I would turn it over to these guys after that. Yeah, uh, one thing I always tell patients is this. Your lungs only want one thing in them, and that's good old clean air. Anything else is unnatural to your lungs. You go out there, you get sprayed with perfume, guess what happens? Your lungs reject it, you start coughing up. It's a natural response. Your lungs don't want any of that in you. And especially if it's something that's smoked, I mean, it just makes sense that it shouldn't be there. I think any, you know, uh, especially now with e-cigarettes and vaping, whether it's nicotine or, or marijuana, anything you inhale in is gonna have some uh, irritation to the lungs. And, and we don't know really the long-term effects of those modalities, but uh, whether it's gonna be COPD or cancer, it may turn up in the future. I remember Joe DiMaggio is in, in a famous commercial advertising Chesterfields tell them <laughs> how much of a better baseball player it made him. We didn't, they didn't know at that point. Uh, and I think the same rule can be applied to, va to vaping. Uh, I got in big trouble with that, with that industry. Uh, I made a comment on the news about how I thought it was awful, particularly their, the way they directed it towards kids with the flavors. It's clearly, you know, and it's, you start there, it starts an oral, you know, hand oral, Habit it leads to tobacco without a doubt. It's 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 and and maybe maybe as a bridge to quit smoking. Uh, I, I I can't even endorse it for that. So, vape marijuana like these guys said. What belongs in your lungs is what exists here. <laughs> is that clear to everyone? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now I'm going to have a more specific uh, question. Um, VATS or robotic surgery, which is best? And then the second question, blood test to detect lung cancer. Is anything like that in the works? Let's start with the technical question first, that uh, the difference between VATS and a, and a ro robot. As I tried to stress, they're, they both represent a, a minimally invasive approach to the chest cavity, so it is a technique. and. Whichever one that the operating surgeon is more comfortable with, more experienced with, uh, will undoubtedly lead to a better result. And they, they both uh, are, are much better than the traditional open incision with the spreading of, of the ribs. And then uh, any, uh, any chance that we're going to get a blood test for lung cancer screening? Uh, <coughs> not anything good. Uh, there are, um, <coughs> there's a test called liquid biopsy, and so um, it's in research studies to see if there are some tests that might pick up some of the uh, material or um, uh, DNA material from, from cancer, but we're a long ways from that. Just, just kind of a spin off on that. You, you, you mentioned my work with the Jet Propulsion Lab uh, started the scientists that developed the uh, Mars rover, the instrument that went out onto the surface of Mars and collected samples and, uh, of, of the atmosphere. As part of their research for that, they saw that certain organic chemicals that are emitted in our breath may give us an indication of what's going on inside. Uh, liver disease is one, and they were quite interested in lung cancer. And that's where we're kind of working with that, that there are certain organic compounds that may be found in a person's breath that indicates what's going on in here. And so if you see something in the lung, you, you know, collect a, a, a exhaled specimen, analyze it, and it may be able to give us an idea of what's going on there without anything invasive. But that's kind of the derivation. But as far as a, a, a blood test, no, we're, we're not quite there yet. So that's a nice segue until this question. What is the jet Propulsion Labs Lung Cancer Program. Seems like an odd program for JPL. Sure does, but it's, a, it's you know, when, when you're those guys and you drink that much coffee and stay up that late, <laughs> you come up with all kinds of crazy ideas. But 
they were just looking for a commercial spinoff on their science that, that they had seen. And, and part of the, like I said, just studying or organic uh, molecules, they'd come upon re research of people saying that the ex exhaled breath of humans may indicate disease processes going on inside. All right, so we're going to have a few uh, drug-related questions now. Why are the drugs like Dilara and Advair so expensive? <laughs> you know, it's a um, good question. I wish they were cheaper. Um, and unfortunately, from our perspectives, we actually really don't know how much they are costing you guys as patients when we prescribe them. It's only when you come back and give us that feedback because there's so many factors at play, right? Whether your insurance covers it, et cetera. But um, <clears throat> to the pharmaceutical industry's defense, which I hate to do, um, a lot of research does come into the development of these um, drugs. And so, you know, they spend millions if not billions of dollars developing these drugs and the delivery mechanisms um, up front, right? These are only the drugs that we know about, but there are several drugs that never make it to market that they have to spend billions and billions of dollars on, and this is how they make up, unfortunately. Um, should it stay that way? I, I wish it doesn't. I wish there was a way in which we can make all drugs affordable to everyone. If only there were a way. I think it's what the, the market will bear, and the U.S. market uh, is, a, is a free market, so the drug companies will charge what, what they want. I mean, you know you can go to, ad, <coughs> to Europe and get, uh, you know, an ad beer inhaler for one euro, which is just over a dollar. Uh, and here, you can, you know, your copay could be $100 or $200, and sometimes it seems to change every month. So there's really no rhyme or reason. Uh, so. And a follow-up question just from the primary care uh, point of view. You know, QVAR is an older drug. Why aren't even the older drugs cheaper? I mean, you can't find any of the inhalers to be reasonable. Uh, again, I think it's just the, whatever the, the market and demand is. You would think that the ones that have gone generic would be, and some of them have, are a little cheaper. Uh, but it just hasn't worked out, especially for the inhalers. <laughs> yeah, oftentimes we have to play a game of, you know, telephone with the, the pharmacy and you know, calling different prescriptions and eventually we'll find the one that's cheapest. And sometimes we're surprised. It might be the, the newest, most advanced, you know, delivery mechanism there is and that ends up being the one that is cheapest for our patients. And it's, it's, it's to kind of add to that, it's, it's the interaction with the pharmaceutical industries, the insurance industry and what kind of relationship they have and then the poor patient gets stuck in the middle uh, and it's such a nightmare. All right, now about um, Singular. A cardiologist recently told me Singular is good for asthma, that the inhalers have side effects. Uh, is Singular effective without side effects? Uh, Singular is a, is a great drug, actually, and it is a part of the um, sort of the stepwise manner in which we um, prescribed medications or inhalers um, for the treatment of or the management of asthma. Um, it works in a very specific uh, uh, mechanism, and it, uh, working on that infl inflammatory process that uh, that I, I spoke of earlier. Um, in some patients, it's very effective. In others, it doesn't seem to do anything for them. So it's very patient specific. Um, we get into this battle with the cardiologist very frequently about the inhalers and you know the side effects. If you use your inhaler appropriately, correctly, you rinse and gargle your mouth afterwards, you really shouldn't be having the side effects that the cardiologist is talking about. But again, that's a discussion that is very patient specific and, 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 and you should talk to your doctor about it. All right, now I have several questions about the low dose uh, lung, uh, CT lung screening. Um, several questions are about people that have only been exposed to secondhand s smoke. Should they be getting, uh, having access to that? And then a uh, side question is, uh, should an ex-smoker get the CT scan? How often will Medicare pay? There, there is um, Med Medicare 
uh, ha has established a, a very strict criteria about who qualifies for a screening CT exam examination of the chest. It, it delineates certain age, it delineates certain amount of smoke uh, <coughs> history. Uh, it does not take into account secondhand smoke, which I feel very strongly about. Um, and it, it then says, well, these are, these are the people that we feel that are at high risk. I think that anybody who has a thought about it, who has any exposure to it, that the, the radiation exposure, the amount of clinical information gained, and the, in, in the incredibly affordability of it, that even if it's not quite what we call a screening CT under a screening pro program, to, to a get a low dose CT examination is, is the right thing to do. I, I just, I, I don't know, you all feel I agree. I think anyone who has secondhand exposure or a significant amount of it or is concerned getting a low-dose screening CT is appropriate. I mean, the, the criteria accepted by Medicare just happen to be the criteria that were set up for the particular study, so they were translated. You have to be a specific age, 55 to, I think, 74, not 75. So they, they set, <coughs> they just followed the criteria that the study was done in, but I think we've accepted a wider range for that in, in clinical practice. I think it's still an evolving field, too. I think that it's just because the study was done specifically in these, these patients with the specific um, smoking, you know, uh, history, and that's why Medicare has sort of used that, that guideline. Um, but I agree. I think patients who have a significant secondhand smoking uh, history, um, it would be wise that we start looking into the whether or not it's beneficial for those patients. It's also a discussion that you should have with your doctor and with regards to when you get this CT, what should you expect from it? Because sometimes when we get that CT, we might find, you know, something that, you know, will be life-saving, but also you might find something that will eventually need biopsies, and, and it puts you down this road, and, and sometimes when we do the resection, you might not find anything. But that's, that's sort of the risk that, that will save lives eventually. As a, so it's kind of an anecdotal story. I had a patient who manages a hedge fund, and she was investigating a certain company that, that they were going to invest in. It happened to be a radio, radiologic, some, some type of scanner. And it's just a matter of, they asked her, would you like a scan? And she goes, well, sure. It was an otherwise healthy 55-year-old non-smoking woman, went through the scanner and found a right lower lobe cancer that we removed and, and you know. So it's, what is the point? <laughs> the point is, is that if you think about it, it's, I, I think it's a great test to do. The only downside, as uh, Dr. Wynn mentioned, is there are a lot of what we call false positives. And that's why part of the discussion is discussing with your patient what to do for these. I mean, there are lots of spots we all have. It's easy on the surface, but we have moles and things like that that the dermatologist can see and scrape off or take a picture of and measure month to month. On the inside, we can't do it so easily. Uh, so we have to make a decision, a clinical decision, what the risk is and whether we're going to biopsy it or resect it or, or what to do. And since there are a high number of um, what we call false positive little spots we find that are probably meaningless, especially as, as in older patients, we see more of those things, uh, you have to be upfront and discuss those possibilities. Something that's, that's unique to Torrance here is that as part of our tumor board, I kind of mentioned, is that we have scans that are marked. And if anybody has a spot, a nodule on a CT scan, it, it gets highlighted, our nurse navigator is aware of it, and as part of the tumor board, we have a discussion among all of us. We look at the scans and decide what would be the right thing to do. Does it need further intervention at this time? Does it need follow-up? So to kind of help deal with this, it's uh, not just something being made in a, you know, a x-ray in a vacuum, but there's actually a collection of physicians that review it, make a recommendation, and then follow up. This is outstanding. All right, what are the characteristics for the high-risk patient for cancer surgery? Excellent question. Um, a lot of people think age is, and I can tell you right now that there's a difference between chronologic age and physiologic age. There are patients routinely, what we call octogenarians, those in their 80s, uh, that I don't think twice about taking to the operating room because we know 
that statistically their chance of independent living into their 90s is greater than anybody sitting at this table right now because they've already made it that far. Uh, so we look at things, uh, heart function, pulmonary function, uh, kidney function, a global examination uh, to try to, to, to determine uh, what would be the risk. And what we find is that people with a, a advanced cardiac disease, multiple heart attacks, the number one reason why we won't operate on somebody is that their underlying lung function would not tolerate if I removed a portion of their lung, no matter how small. The risk of them to that is, 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 is exceeds the benefit. And that's why pe people are, are not only evaluated radiographically, looking at x-rays, but physiologically. Again, a, 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 an emphasis on that multidisciplinary conference. I don't see a patient, if these guys don't think that the patient is an adequate surgical candidate or a, a, a you know, that, the, that they could tolerate that. But I would say that it's the you know, cardiac function, the lung function, everybody has put through the uh, rigorous preoperative e evaluation and determined whether or not the risk of the operation is outweighed by the benefit. I have a cousin in her 20s who died from an asthma attack. How common is this? Uh, unfortunately, it's too common. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that we do have to deal with from time to time. Bad asthma is just, when those airways clamp down, you, you try to do any, the, the problem is, is once those airways clamp down, we can't get the medications to the areas in which uh, to help alleviate that, that symptom. And so that's why it's really important that um, if you do have asthma, you talk to your doctor about that plan. Uh, so at, at the onset of symptoms, uh, you know exactly what to do, and you can get treated um, as, as soon and as early as possible. Does CBD oil help with lung inflammation? I, I don't think that there's any long-term studies or evidence that has shown that CBD oil is, is helpful for, for, long, for lung inflammation. I, I've, I haven't seen that. I can tell you right now, I've had many patients tell me that it helps significantly with incisional pain. And it's, it's to the point that I kind of off the record say, you know, if you're still having pain, let me try this. And, and it's been remarkable for people. And, and, it, and it does not have THC in it, so there's no... Yeah. Gee, that's a great point. Um, there's a, a big distinction between um, the CBD-only oils or food products or whatnot versus those that have THC. The, the THC is the sort of psychoactive portion of, of, of marijuana or, can, or cannabinoids. And so um, the, the risk for those types of events when you're using a CBD-only product is, is greatly improved. And it is very helpful in, 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 in patients with, with significant pain. Um, I, I've seen CBD oil do amazing things for anxiety, depression, insomnia, chronic pain. Um, I know that there are neurologists working on it for Parkinson's and dementia, and the FDA just approved it for treatment of seizures in babies. If you guys want to get in on the ground floor, I think CBD is really going to be the drug of the future. I smoked in my teens and early 20s. Um, when I stopped. Now in my late 70s, will my smoking catch up with me in my 80s and 90s? Um, <coughs> probably a small chance of developing any uh, respiratory problems now, but uh, as Dr. Wynn mentioned, uh, there probably is some subtle uh, damage, and so it's possible, you know, if you get a bad pneumonia or some other respiratory problem now, you might have a little more severe course than you would have if you had never smoked, but <coughs> the likelihood of uh, 50 years ago and, and smoking for 10 or 15 years, developing COPD at this late stage is probably pretty small. So this is a question about uh, an 85-year-old. On the treadmill, my ability to do intermittent jogging has decreased a lot in the past two or three years. Any cause for alarm? Uh, 
well, there's no way you know to tell whether that's sort of a, a natural aging decline. <coughs> I think if if uh, if it's a more dramatic change, then it should be evaluated. We don't know if it could be a variety of things, and the problem is patients present with shortness of breath, and it's a million varieties. It could be anemic, uh, you could have lung problem, a variety of lung problems, a variety of cardiac issues, muscle issues. Uh, so, so to have to start at the beginning and take a good history and move through the process. Get rid of the treadmill. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, we, we're gonna touch uh, a little bit on some TB. Do TB meds uh, do damage to the liver? How do you treat latent TB? And then uh, does vitamin D help prevent lung disease? Uh, so the first question was, do the TB medications affect the liver? They can. And so when you're, if someone is on medications for, uh, for tuberculosis, um, you should have your liver function tested and, and then monitored for um, the possibility of having a liver dysfunction. Um, Uh, how do you treat latent TB? So latent, tur tuber latent tuberculosis is the, the inactive version of tuberculosis, and that also is treated with certain, um, with a, with there's a variety of different antimicrobials that you can use for it, um, uh, and you would be treated for an extended period of time. Um, vitamin D um, and whether or not it helps your lungs, I. I don't think that there's any sort of conclusive evidence that have shown that vitamin D is, is um, helpful for your lungs, but it's great for your bones. <laughs> also, vitamin D seems to be now the, uh, the latest uh, test that everyone seems to have low vitamin D level and everybody seems to be on supplemental vitamin D. So I don't know what's happened over the past five years, why it's become uh, in the news, but uh, so maybe because of that, it's thought it uh, might have some effect on lung function. And I, I'm very intrigued with what you had talked about uh, with women, uh, particularly younger women that have never been smokers. Now one of the really big growing population of people getting lung cancer and often pretty aggressive lung cancer that isn't curable. Does anybody have any theories on where this is coming from? Unfortunately not. It, it, it's a very active area uh, in our research labs trying, trying to determine. You know, it's just recently that we looked at the epidemiology of it and kind of discovered it. But I can just tell you, the people I see coming through my office, it's dramatic, the, the, the change. You know, we used to associate a cancer in the lung was, was the guy that had been, you know, in the Army given Hershey bars and cigarettes <laughs> and smoked through life. And, and women did not smoke. And, and that's kind of part, it's a very interesting cultural thing that when, when the whole madman kind of you know, cocktail age came, came, came around, women began to smoke, and so now men have quit. For the most part, men have, have no, I shouldn't say quit, but the, the number of men smokers is far less than the number of women. And so the rates continue to, to traject upward. And um, there was a particular type of cigarette, it's called a Virginia Slim. On their units, and their slogan was, "You've come a long way, baby." Well, they <laughs> truly have. <laughs> you know, is that not only are you doing it, you know, as good as men, you're doing it better. But but there has to be, and it, it's it's also kind of in, in, uh, interesting. It's it's not only the the rates, but it's also the the response to treatment is a little different as well too. Uh, but the 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 you know the pillar. Of, of treatment in this is early, detect, early detection and aggressive control. So we've reached the end of the uh, evening. I would like to ask all of us to give our panel a very appreciative uh, round of applause.